Once again, uh, thank you all for being here. And most of you have been here for most of the performances um, and or are people who are probably already familiar with the story in one form or another. But for anyone who might not be and or who might have missed a performance or two, and because it's all confusing enough even for us who are performing it every week because there's a lot to it all, uh, a little recap is always uh, in order. Um, so basically, the big time is the name for uh, wars that are fought and a realm that is beyond the ordinary realm uh, called the little time of what we usually think of as time and progression of history and the events and so on. And in this scenario, people are plucked out um, from their, their regular lives just before they're about to die. And in that way, resurrected and recruited into the big time, which is a war uh, that is going on across many times and places, different planets, dimensions, and so on, between the spiders and the snakes. Um, about which we know almost nothing other than their names, that they're called the spiders and the snakes. And uh, our entire action takes place um, at a place called the place, which is a sort of um, recuperation station uh, about as big maybe as a football field that's in outer space. Um, that's uh, inhabited uh, at one time or another by various nurses and um, uh, people, soldiers who are in from the various battles in the various time frames throughout history uh, in this battle between the spiders and the snakes. And in this place called the place, um, uh, Again, recuperation goes on, healing, um, both in the traditional healing sense and also in the carousing around with the nurses and the laboratenders sense and so on and so forth. And our various characters are in constant various discussions with one another with respect to who really are the spiders and the snakes, what's really going on, what battles are they really fighting? What's the ultimate goal of it all? And so on and so forth. And just the kind of stuff you might expect given that scenario. And then somebody challenges the whole scenario and sort of is raising, raising some mutinous thoughts of one sort or another. And um, then, um, uh, something called the maintainer, which is a small device, uh, radio size, maybe big radio size, small device that um, maintains the environment of this, the place existing out in outer space in the middle of the void somewhere. And uh, the maintainer has been taken and uh, is missing and uh, when that happens, it causes the entire place to go on inversion, which everything basically shuts down, the doors to the outside worlds and so on and so forth. So things are now in a bit of a frenzy as people are looking for the maintainer, accusing one another of who took it, who didn't take it. And um, there's also the small matter of a, a, an atomic bomb that's about to go off. And um, this is what we're entering into um, in uh, the episodes that uh, we will be exploring tonight. Uh, once again, please make sure to keep your microphones uh, uh, muted uh, if you're not talking. And um, uh, thank you all so very much for your presences here. And please, relax and enjoy the show, which if you think about it, um, since everyone here will know the reference, um, the place is a little bit sort of kind of 
like Morton Street. Um, and also sort of kind of like our world in a way, a bunch of people sitting around um, seemingly helpless to change things, but also possibly being the last ones that are existing and how might we move things forward and so, so on and so forth. So with that, we invite you to join us in the place. Now is a bearable burden. What buckles the back is the added weight of the past's mistakes and the future's fears. I had to learn to close the front door to tomorrow and the back door to yesterday and settle down to here and now. So, so said Anonymous. A big opportunity. Nobody laughed at Eric's screwball sarcasms. And still I thought, yes, perish his hysterical little gray head, but he's half right. Lily's got the big thing now, and she wants to serve it up to the rest of us on a platter. Only Luff doesn't cook and cut that way. Those weren't bad ideas she had about the maintainer though, especially the one about the ghost girls doing the introverting. It would explain why there couldn't be introversion drill, the manual stuff about blue flashes being window dressing, and something disappearing without movement or transition is the sort of thing that might not catch the attention. And I guess they gave the others something to think about too, for there wasn't any follow-up to Eric's frantic sniping. But I honestly didn't see where there was this big opportunity being stuck away in a gray sack in the void. And I began to wonder, and I got the strangest feeling. And I said to myself, hang on to your hat, Greta, it's hope. The dreadful thing about being a demon is that you have all time to range through. Lily smiled. You can never shut the back door to yesterday or the front door to tomorrow and simply live in the present. But now that's been done for us, the door is shut. We need never again rehash the past or the future. The spiders and snakes can never find us. For who ever heard of a place that was truly lost being rescued? And as those in the know have told me, introversion is the end as far as those outside are concerned. So we are safe from the spiders and snakes. We need never be slaves or enemies again, and we have a place in which to live our new lives, the place prepared for us from the beginning. Surely you understand what I mean. Sydney and Beauregard and Dr. Paiskov are the ones who explain it to me. The place is a balanced aquarium, just like the cosmos. No one knows how many ages of big time it has been in use without a bit of new material being brought in only luxuries and people and not a bit of waste cast off. No one knows how many more ages 
it may not sustain life. I never heard of minor maintainers wearing out. We have all the future, all the security anyone can hope for. We have a place to live together. You know, she was dead right. And I realized that all the time I had the conviction in the back of my mind that we were going to suffocate or something if we didn't get a door open pretty quick. I should have known differently if anybody should because I'd once been in the place without a door for as long as a hundred sleeps during a foxhole stretch of the change war. And we'd had to start cycling our food and it had been okay. And then because it is also the way my mind works, I started to picture in a flash the consequences of our living together all by ourselves, like Lily said. I began to pair people off. I couldn't help it. Let's see, four women, six men, two ETs. Greta, I said, you're gonna be Miss Polly Andrew for sure. We'll have a daily newspaper and folk dancing classes. We'll shut the bar except evenings. Bruce will keep a rhymed history of the place. I even thought, well, I knew this part was strictly silly, about schools and children. I wondered what cities would look like, or my little commandants. Don't go near the voids, dear. Of course, that would be especially hard on the two ETs. But 7C at least wasn't so different, and the genetics boys had made some wonderful advances, and Maud ought to know about them. And there were some amazing gadgets in surgery when Doc sobered up, the patter of little hoofs. My fiance spoke to you about carrying a peace message to the rest of the cosmos and bringing an end to the big change in healing all the wounds that have been made in the little time. I looked at Bruce. His face was set and strained, as will happen to the best of them when a girl starts talking about her man's business. And I don't know why, but I said to myself, she's crucifying him. She's nailing him to his purpose, the woman will, even when there's not much point to it, as now. It was a wonderful thought. But now we cannot carry or send any message. And I believe it is too late in any event for a peace message to do any good. The cosmos is too rivaled by change, too far gone. It will dissolve, fade, leave not a rock behind. We are the survivors. The torch of existence has been put in our hands. We may already be all that's left in the cosmos. For have you thought that the change winds may have died at their source? We may never reach another cosmos. We may drift forever in the void, but who of us has been introverted before? And who knows what we can or cannot do? We are a seed for a new future to grow from. Perhaps all doomed universes cast off seeds like this place. It's a seed. It's an embryo. Let it grow. She looked swiftly at Bruce and then at Sid. Come, my friends. This is not too late to seek a newer world. I squeezed Sid's hand and I started to say something to him, but he didn't know I was there. He was listening to Lily quote Tennyson with his eyes entranced and his mouth open as if he were imagining new things to put into it. Oh, city. And then I saw the others were looking at her the same way. Ilhilihis was seeing finer feather forests than a long dead Luna's grow. 
The greenhouse child, Maud Ap Ares Davies, was stowing away on a starship bound for another galaxy, or thinking how different her life might have been, the children she might have had if she'd stayed on the planets and out of the change world. Even Eric looked as though he might be blitzing new universes, and Mark subduing them for an eight-legged fear imperator, Bo was throbbing up a wider Mississippi in a bigger-than-life side-wheeler. Even I, well, I wasn't dreaming of a greater Chicago. Let's not go hot wild on this sort of thing, I told myself. But I did look up at the void, and I got a shiver because I imagined it drawing away and the whole place starting to grow. I truly meant what I said about a sea. I know, as you all do, there are no children in the change world, that there cannot be, that we all become instantly sterile, that what they call a curse is lifted from us girls, and we are no longer in bondage to the moon. She was right, all right. If there's one thing that's been proved a million times in the change world, it's that. But we are no longer in the change wall. And its limitations should no longer apply to us, including that one. I feel deeply certain of it. But she looked around slowly. We are four women here, and I thought one of us might have a sure indication. My eyes followed her around like anybody's would. In fact, everybody was looking around except Maud, and she had the silliest look of surprise on her face, and it stayed there. And then, very carefully, she got down from the bar stool with her knitting. She looked at the half-finished pink bra with the long white needle stuck in it, and her eyes bugged bigger yet, as if she were expecting it to turn into a baby sweater right then and there. Then she walked across the place to Lily and stood beside her. While she was walking, the look of surprise changed to a quiet smile. The only other thing she did was throw her shoulders back a little. I was jealous of her for a second, but it was a double miracle for her, considering her age, and I couldn't grudge her that. And to tell the truth, I was a little frightened too. Even with Dave, I'd been bothered about this business of having babies. Yet I stood up with Siddy. I couldn't stop myself. And I guess he couldn't either. And hand in hand, we walked to the control divan. Bo and Seven C were there, and Bruce, of course. And then, so help me, those soldiers to the death, Cabby and Mark, started over from the bar. And I couldn't see anything in their eyes about the greater glory of Crete and Rome, but something, I think, about each other. And after a moment, Billy slowly detached himself from the piano and followed, lightly trailing his tentacles on the floor. I couldn't exactly see him hoping for little illies in this company, unless it was true what the joke said about the Lunans, but maybe he was being really disinterested, and maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was simply figuring that Lily ought to be, Illy ought to be on the side with the biggest battalions. I heard dragging footsteps behind us, and here came Doc from the gallery, carrying in his folded arms an abstract sculpture as big as a newborn baby. It was an agglomeration of perfect shiny gray spheres the size of golf balls, shaping up to something like a large brain, but with holes showing through here and there. He held it out to us like an infant to be admired and worked his lips and tongue 
as if they were trying very hard to say something, though not a word came out that you could understand. And I thought, Maxi Alexevich may be speechless drunk and have all sorts of holes in his head, but he's got the right instincts. Bless his soulful little Russian heart. We were all crowded around the control divan like a football team huddling. The peace packers, it came to me. Seventh C would be fullback or center. An illy left end. What a receiver. Right number, too. Eric was alone at the bar. But now even he... Oh, no, this can't be, I thought, even as he came toward us. Then I saw that his face was working the worst ever. He stopped halfway and managed to force a smile, but it was the worst, too. That's my little commandant, I thought. No team spirit. So now Lily and Bruce, yes, and Grossmutterchen and Maud have their little nest. He wouldn't have had to push his voice very hard to get a screech. But what are the rest of us supposed to be? Cowbirds? He crooked his neck and flapped his hands and croaked. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! And I said to myself, I often thought you were crazy, boy, but now I know it. Teufel's trick. Yes, devil's dirt. But you all seem to be infected with this dream of children. Can't you see that the change world is the natural and proper end of evolution? A period of enjoyment and measuring, an ultimate working out of things, which women call destruction. Help, I'm being raped. Oh, what are they doing to my children? But which men know as fulfillment. You're given good parts in Gotterdammerung, and you go up to the author and tap him on the shoulder and say, Excuse me, Herr Wagner, but this Twilight of the Gods is just a bit morbid. Why don't you write an opera for me about the little ones, the dear little blue-eyed curly tops? A plot? Oh, boy meets a girl and they settle down to breed. Something like that. Devil's dirt doubled and damned. Have you thought what life will be like without the door to go out of, to find freedom and adventure, to measure your courage and keenness? Do you want to grow long gray beards hobbling around this asteroid turned inside out? Putter around indoors to the end of your days, mooning about little baby cosmoses, incidentally with a live bomb for company, the cave, the womb, the little gray home in the nest. Is that what you want? It'll grow? Oh yes, like the city engulfing the wild wood, a proliferation of Kinderkirche Kuche. I should live so long. Women. How I hate their bright eyes as they look at me from the fireside, bent-shouldered, rocking, deeply happy to be old and say, he's getting weak, he's giving out. Soon I'll have to put him to bed and do the simplest things for him. You're a filthy triple goddess, Kabi, the birther, bride, and barrier of man. Woman, the enfeebler, the fetterer, the crippler. Woman and the curly-headed little cancers she wants. He lurched toward us, pointing at Lily. I never knew one who didn't want to cripple a man if you gave her the chance. Cripple him, swaddle him, clip his wings, grind him to sausage to mold another man. Hers, a doll man. You hid the maintainer, you little smother hen, so you could have your nest and your brucie. He stopped, gasping. And I expected someone to bop him one in the schnozzle, and I think he did too. I turned to Bruce, and he was looking, I don't know how, sorry, guilty, anxious, angry, shaken, inspired all at once. And I wished people sometimes had simple suburban reactions, like magazine stories. Then Eric made the mistake, if it was one, of turning toward Bruce and slowly staggering toward him, pawing the air with his hands as if he were going to collapse into his arms. Don't let them get you, Bruce. Don't let them tie you down. Don't let them clip you, your words or your deeds. You're a soldier. Even when you talked about a peace message, you talked about doing some smashing of your own. No matter what you think and feel, Bruce, no matter how much lying you do and how much you hide, 
You're really not on their side. That did it. It didn't come soon enough, or I think in the right spirit to please me, but I will say it for Bruce that he didn't muck it up by tipping or softening his punch. He took one step forward and his shoulders spun and his fists connected, sweet and clean. As he did it, he said only one word. Low key. And darn if that didn't switch me back to a campfire in the Indiana dunes and my mother telling me out of the Elder Saga about the malicious, sneering, all-spoiling Norse god and how, when the other gods came to trap him in his hideaway by the river, he was on the point of finishing knotting a mysterious net, big enough, I had imagined, to snare the whole universe, and that if they'd come a minute later, he would have. Eric was stretched on the floor, his head hitched up, rubbing his jaw and glaring at Bruce. Mark, who was standing beside me, moved a little, and I thought he was going to do something maybe even clobber Bruce in the old spirit of, you can't do that to my buddy. But he just shook his head and said, Omnia vincit amor. I nudged him and I said, meaning? And he said, Love licks everything. I'd never have expected it from a Roman, but he was half right at any rate. Lily had her victory. Bruce clearing the field for the marriage while laying out the woman-hating boyfriend who would be trying to get him to go out nights. At that moment, I think Bruce wanted Lily and a life with her more than he wanted to reform the change world. Sure, us women have our little victories. Until the legions come, or the little corporal draws up his artillery, or the panzers roar down the road. Eric scrambled to his feet and stood there in a half slump half crouch, still rubbing his jaw and glaring at Bruce over his hand, but making no move to continue the fight. And I studied his face, and I said to myself, if he can get a gun, he's going to shoot himself. I know. Bruce started to say something and hesitated, like I would have in his shoes. And just then, Doc got one of his unpredictable inspirations and went weaving out toward Eric, holding out the sculpture and making deaf and dumb noises like he had to us. Eric looked at him as if he were going to kill him, and then he grabbed the sculpture and swung it up over his head and smashed it down on the floor. And for a wonder, it didn't shatter. It just skidded along in one piece and stopped inches from my feet. That thing not breaking must have been the last straw for Eric, I swear I could see the red surge up through his eyes toward his brain. He swung around to the store sector and ran the few steps between him and the bronze bomb chest. Everything got very slow motion for me, although I didn't do any moving. Almost every man started out after Eric. Bruce didn't, though, and City turned back after the first surge forward. Well, Illy squinched down for a leap, and it was between Seven Seas' hairy shanks and Bo's scissoring white pants that I saw that under-the-microscope circle of death's heads and watched Eric's finger go down on them in the order Cabby had given. One, three, five, six, two, four, seven. I was able to pray seven distinct times that he'd made a mistake. He straightened up. Illy landed by the box like a huge silver spider and his tentacles whipped futilely across its top. The others surged to a frightened halt around them. Eric's chest was heaving, but his voice was cool and collected. You mentioned something about our having a future, Miss Foster. Now you can make that more specific. Unless we get back to the cosmos and dump this box or find a spider A-Tech, or manage to call headquarters for guidance on disarming the bomb. We have a future exactly 30 minutes long. Chapter 13. <clears throat> so says Spencer. 
but whence he was, or of what womb he bore, of beasts, or of the earth, I have not read. But certs was with milk of wolves and tigers fed. The tiger is loose. I guess when they really push the button or throw the switch or spring the trap or focus the beam or what have you, you don't faint or go crazy or anything else convenient. I didn't. Everything, everybody, every move that was made, every word that was spoken was painfully real to me, like hand twisting and squeezing things deep inside me. And I saw every least detail spotlighted and magnified like I had the seven skulls. Eric was standing beyond the bomb chest. Little smiles were ruffling his lips. I'd never seen him look so sharp. Illy was beside him, but not on his side, you understand. Mark, Sevensee, and Bo were around the chest to the nearer side. Bo had dropped to a knee and was scanning the chest minutely, terror under control, making him bend his head a little closer than he needed to for clear vision, but with his hands locked together behind his back. I guessed to restrain the impulse to push anything and everything that looked like a disarming button. Doc was sprawled face down on the nearest couch, out like a light, I suppose. Us four girls were still by the control divan, with Cabby, that surprised me because she didn't look scared or frozen, but almost as intensely alive as Eric. Sid had turned back, as I said, and had one hand stretched out toward, but not touching the minor maintainer, in a look on his beardy face as if he were calling down death and destruction on every boozy rogue who had ever gone up from King's Lynn to Cambridge in London. And I realized why. If he'd thought of the minor maintainer a second sooner, he could have pinned Eric down with heavy gravity before he could touch the buttons. Bruce was resting one hand on the head of the control divan and was looking toward the group around the chest toward Eric, I think, as if Eric had done something rather wonderful for him. Wonderful for him, though I can't imagine myself being tickled at being included in anybody's suicide surprise party. Bruce looked altogether too dreamy, Brahma blast him, for someone who must have the same steel-spiked thought in his head that I know darn well the rest of us had, that in 29 minutes or so, the place would be in a sun, a sun in a bag. Eric was the first to get down to business. As I'd have laid any odds he would be, he had the jump on us, and he wasn't going to lose it. Well, when are you going to start getting Lily to tell us where she hid the maintainer? It has to be her. She was too certain it was gone forever when she talked. And Bruce must have seen from Zabar who took the maintainer. And who would he cover up for but his girl? There he was plagiarizing my ideas. But I guess I was willing to sign them over to him in full if he got us the right pail of water for that time bomb. He glanced at his wrist. According to my caller, you have 29 and a half minutes including the time it will take to get the door or contact headquarters. When are you going to get busy on the girl? Bruce laughed a little, deprecatingly so help me, and started toward him. Look here, old man. There's no need to trouble Lily or to fuss with headquarters, even if you could. Really, not at all. Not to mention that your surmises are quite unfounded, old chap and I'm a bit surprised that you're advancing them. But that's quite all right, because, as it happens, I'm an atomics technician, and I even worked on that very bomb. To disarm it, you just have to fiddle a bit with some of the onks, those hoopy little crosses. Here, let me. 
Allah ill Allah, but it must have struck everybody as it did me as being just too incredible an assertion, too bloody British a bare-faced bluff, for Eric didn't have to say a word. Mark and Sevensey grabbed Bruce by the arms, one on each side as he stooped towards the bronze chest, and they were gentle about it. Oh no, Bruce. Very sporting of you to try to cover up for your girlfriend, but we aren't going to let ourselves be blown to strict atoms 28 minutes too soon while you monkey with the buttons. The very thing Benson Carter warned against and pray for a guesswork miracle. It's too thin, Bruce. When you come from 1917 and haven't been on the big time for a hundred sleeps and were calling for an ATEC yourself a few hours ago, much too thin. Bruce, something is going to happen that I'm afraid you won't like, but you're going to have to put up with it. That is, unless Miss Foster decides to be cooperative. I say, you fellows, let me go. Bruce struggled experimentally. I know it's a bit thick to swallow, and I did give you the wrong impression calling for an ATEC, but I just wanted to capture your attention then. I didn't want to have to work on the bomb. Really, Eric, would you, would they have ordered Benson Carter to pick us up unless one of us were an ATEC? They'd be sure to include one in the Bali operation. Then they are using patchwork tactics? Eric grinningly quoted back at him. Cabby spoke up beside me. Benson Carter was a magician of matter and... He was going on the operation disguised as an old woman. We have the cloak and hood with the other garments. And I wondered how this cold fish of a she officer could be the same girl who was giving Mark slurpy looks not 10 minutes ago. Well? Eric glanced at his collar and then swinging his eyes around at us as if there must be some of the old Wehrmacht iron somewhere. We all found ourselves looking at Lily, and she was looking so sharp herself, so ready to jump and so at bay, that it was all I needed at any rate to make Eric's theory about the maintainer a rock-bottom certainty. Bruce must have realized the way our minds were working, for he started to struggle in earnest and the, at the same time called, for God's sake, don't do anything to Lily. Let me loose, you idiots. Everything's true, I told you. I can save you from that bomb. Seven C, you took my side against the spiders. You've nothing to lose. Sid, you're an Englishman. Bo, you're a gentleman and you love her too. For God's sake, stop them. Bo glanced up over his shoulder at Bruce and the others surging around close to his ankles, and he had on his poker face. Sid, I could tell, was once more going through the purgatory of decision. Bo reached his own decision first, and I'll say it for him that he acted on it fast and intelligently. Right from his kneeling position, and before he'd even turned his head quite back, he jumped Eric. But other things in this cosmos beside man can pick sides and act fast. Billy landed on Bo midway and whipped his tentacles around him tight, and they went wobbling around like a drunken white and silver barber pole. Bo got his hands around, each, each around a tentacle, and at the same time his face began to get purple, and I winced at what they were both going through. Maybe Seven C had a hoof in Sid's purgatory because Bruce shook loose from the satyr and to tried to knock out Mark, but the Roman twisted his arm and kept him from getting in a good punch. Eric didn't make a move to mix into either fight, which is my little commandant all over, using his fists on any but the knee is beneath him. Then Sid made his choice, but there was no way for me to tell what it was, for as he reached for the minor maintainer, Cabby contemptuously snatched it away from his hands and gave him a knee in the belly that doubled me up in sympathy and sent him sprawling on his knees toward the fighters. On the return, 
Cabby gave Lily, who started to grab two, an effortless backhand smash that set her down on the divan. Eric's face lit up like an electric sign, and he kept his eyes fixed on Cabby. She crouched a little, carrying her weight on the balls of her feet and firmly cradling the maintainer in her left arm like a basketball captain planning an offensive. Then she waved her free hand decisively to the right. I didn't get it, but Eric did, and Mark too, for Eric jumped for the refresher sector, and Mark let go of Bruce and followed him, ducking around Seven Seas' arms, who was coming back into the fight, on which side I don't know. Illy unwhipped from Bo and copied Eric and Mark with one big spring. Then Cabby twisted a dial as far as it would go, and Bruce, Bo, Seven C, and poor City were slammed down and pinned to the floor by about eight gravities. It should have been lighter near me. I hoped it was, but you couldn't tell from watching City. He went flat on his face, spread eagled, one hand stretched toward me so close I could have touched it, but not let go. And his mouth was open against the floor, and he was gasping through a corner of it, and I could see his spine trying to sink through his belly. Bruce just managed to get his head and one shoulder up a bit, and they all made me think of a Dory illustration of the Inferno, where the cream of the damned are frozen up to their necks in ice in the innermost circle of hell. The gravity didn't catch me, although I could feel it in my left arm. I was mostly in the refresher sector, but I dropped down flat too, partly out of crazy compassion I have, but mostly because I didn't want to take a chance of having Cabby knock me down. Eric, Mark, and Illy had got clear, and they headed toward us. Maud picked the moment to make her play. She hadn't much of a choice of times if she wanted to make one. The old girl was looking it for once, but I guess the thought of her miracle must have survived alongside the fear of sacked son. It must have meant a lot to her, for she launched out fast, all set to straight-arm Cabby into the heavy gravity and grab the minor maintainer with her other hand. This concludes episode seven of The Big Time for this evening.